we want to welcome you to this morning's service. Thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to whatever the Lord has in store. Uh, our time is His, and this service is His, and we invite you to stand so we can sing about the great hope that is only found in Him. Sing out this morning. I have Good to be in church this morning, isn't it? You would 
Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Lord. You've searched me, Lord. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. I am still with you. Such love the Father has for us. Such love, it's incomprehensible. It's all-consuming. It is unconditional. He makes all things new. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. tree 
you're here in this service today and you haven't been touched by his presence and you have a special need in your heart, a burden you're carrying, we'd love to just bear that burden with you today in prayer. How many have a burden today you're thinking about just troubling you today? Heavenly Father, we, we know that you know our name. We thank you that you can inscribe our name in the Lamb's book of life through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you that you're our personal Savior. And Lord, your word encourages us to cast all of our cares on you. And trade burdens. Your, our burden that we leave on your shoulders. Your word tells us very clearly that we can trust you to carry it. And I pray for each one that raised their hands. Some here are grieving the loss of a loved one. We know that, Lord. Some are heavily burdened for a lost loved one who doesn't know Jesus. Some have pretty serious sickness, Lord. You know that. You're the great physician. So we bring it to you, God. We give it to you. We offer it to you, knowing that you're able, more than able and willing to meet the need. Thank you. Thank you for calling us by name. And as this service progresses, strengthen our faith in you, that when we leave here, we'll leave here different than when we came, ready, ready to be everything you want us to be. Heal bodies, touch lives, Save souls today, and we'll praise you for it. We pray for our missionaries today all over this planet. Bless them, minister to them and through them. Provide their needs, we pray. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise his name. Please be seated.
have a message on my heart today. The Lord has just burned into me, and uh, I think it's very timely. The title of my message is Why America Needs the Church. We just came through a very, very, in my opinion, this is my opinion, an uplifting uh, experience with a peaceful transition of power through the inauguration of a new president. And uh, some have said it was the most Christian uh, inauguration in history. There were several people that prayed, and every one of them, with the exception of the rabbi who prayed to his God, prayed in the name of Jesus. And I just thought that was awesome today. I know it, it, it torques Hollywood. They don't like that but to pray in the name of Jesus to millions of people hearing it was very refreshing to me. And it just confirmed really what the Lord had laid in my heart earlier in the week about my message today, why America needs the church. And we are the church. And I hope that we represent him properly in... Uh, in our society. My scripture is uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a candle or lamp and put her under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine, so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This is the, 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 the meat part of the Sermon on the Mount, the, ch the challenge to uh, believers today. So when you ask the question, what is the church? You get a lot of different definitions. It's not a building. There are some majestic buildings, Gothic architecture, and, and then there's quaint wooden churches you find all over New England. And uh, there's square churches and round churches and churches that look like golf balls and rectangular shaped, and churches that meet in shopping centers and, and uh, churches that meet uh, in, in the woods sometimes until they get a building. There's many different kinds of churches. We, met our, we started out in a gymnasium as we started Family Worship Center now 33 years ago. But it was church to us, a little old smelly gymnasium. But uh, many people came to Christ in that place and, and uh, still are still around and still coming. So I've come to the conclusion a church cannot be identified by buildings or facilities or organizations church is people. The church is not an organization, but it's an organism, a living, breathing organism. Some churches have no facilities. Some are poorly organized. I understand that in, in China, for instance, churches meet wherever they can, and many of them have to meet uh, basically in basements or hiding from the authorities because of the threat to their lives. But there's still churches. Millions of people around the world do not meet in a church like this or a building like this. In Romans chapter 16, Paul said he's greeting Priscilla and Aquila and the church that is in your house. In Philemon, Paul wrote to Philemon and to the church that was in his house. So they had house churches. A good fundamental description of the church could be said this way. The church is the body of Christ, the habitation of God through the Spirit, an agency of God to evangelize the world. Do you agree with that? Amen. Thank you, Robert. That's why we're here. We're here to spread the news. And as individuals and part of this organism, 
It's our responsibility to begin at home, begin at our Jerusalem to evangelize our area and evangelize the world, let our light shine. But I believe that's a good definition of the church. So it's not an organization, but to be disorganized isn't pleasing to God at all. It goes against scripture. So we must be organized and God has given the church gifts of administration. We have to be so careful though, not to be so involved in running and making the business of the church run that uh, we forget what our bottom line is. Our bottom line is souls. Our business is to impact the world for Jesus. Beginning here. Do I need my amen flag? <laughs> Secular humanists would, would try to put down the importance of the church in the world, belittling the body of Christ. But I tell you, the church is the only breath of fresh air in our bankrupt, morally bankrupt society today. With all the excitement of, of the inauguration and the parades and the crowds, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, it was just thrilling to me to see that Christ was honored. But also following that up on the day after the inauguration, and the day before Right to Life Sunday, which is today, millions marched for women's rights. Now, I'm not against women's rights, but the main right that they were marching for was the right to abort babies. I saw signs and anger and viciousness and vulgarity as I watched some of that. What a difference. The day before what we celebrate is Right to Life Sunday. Our, our de Declaration of Independence says this, we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights such as, what's verse one? Life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Life is in there, that's the first one. That's why we believe in right to life Sunday. So we, under, we have to understand that as the salt of the earth and the light of the world, we need to be involved in society. Salt is a preservative. Salt will prevent rottenness and decay. This world decays pretty rapid, rapidly like rotten fish or rotten meat but salt will hinder the, de the, the decay. God intends that we must be one of the most powerful influences in a sinful society, and it must be his redeemed and righteous people. So even though it's an old hymn of the church, probably well over 100 years old, it's still true. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, his soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. We sang that so many times coming up in church. It's the truth. Let's stand up for Jesus. We are his redeemed, righteous people. One theologian put it this way, the church... The Christian is like a moral disinfectant in a, in, in a world where standards are low, constantly changing or non-existent. You know, salt has, is a, has a tremendous effect. It has some great, great uh, effect on things and, and life. So, sodium chloride is a very stable chemical mi mixture which resists every, almost every attack against it. But salt can be contaminated by mixing it with impurities and then it becomes useless, even dangerous. Desalted salt is not, is not even fit for the, the trash heap. It's useless. In the time that Christ was speaking, there, that was considered 
what was considered salt was just a, a white substance which contained sodium chloride, but there was also many impurities in it because there were no refineries back then like we have today. Salt refineries. The real salt could be easily washed out, leaving white powder, which looked like salt, but wasn't salt. It was even called salt, but it didn't taste like salt or act like salt. So it was used then to, as road dust. That's why I said it would be trodden under, under the foot of men. It, it was used as, as road dust, the residue of the good salt. And it's a great description of the church. In, in southern Israel, the bottom end of the Dead Sea, there's a mountain called Sodom Mountain, Mount Sodom. And it's right in the area where Sodom and Gomorrah uh, were destroyed by the Lord. That mountain is also called a mountain of salt. And when we were there last time, the, the guide told us about it, and there, it was tradition, legend said it was where Lot's wife, when she was, was leaving Sodom, she turned and looked, uh, and she was on that mountain when it happened. I don't know if that's true, it's a legend. But if you go take a little piece, just chip a little bit of the, the mountain, and it's a big mountain, chip a little bit of and taste it, it's salt. It tastes like salt. It's called a Mount Sodom or a mountain of salt. And uh, that's why we have to understand why Jesus was so emphatic about, about the effectiveness of salt. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned for Christ? To be effective, now hear this, a Christian must retain our hold on Christ-likeness, just like salt must retain its saltness. The influence of a child of God and the church of Jesus Christ depends on us being different. That's why America needs the church. We add flavor, we add preservative to our society. We cannot be identical to the world. The success of the church when we're absolutely different from the world is, is very effective. When we, are, when we are armed and dangerous to the world in the spiritual sense, if the world would listen to our message and receive the message, we would see great things happening. But if we're not different, they won't receive the message. And the cause of Christ is, is not changed at all. The downward trend takes us from being saviors of the human race to being just something to be stepped on. And then Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Wow. Jesus said, I am the light. And then he said, you are the light of the world. His light must be reflected off of us so that we're shining in the world just like a star shines on a dark night. We are the light of the world. He speaks of this light as good works. Men may see your good works. How are you doing with that? Huh? It's important. It's an expression that covers everything a Christian says and does because we are Christians, that men may see your good works. Light and truth go hand in hand. It's important that we understand that. So a Christian who's a shining light will also include his spoken testimony as well. Isaiah prophesied this. He said, Christ will be a light to the nations. And this prophecy was fulfilled in Christ himself. But it all, it, it, it's also fulfilled in all of us that claim to be Christians. Let your light so shine. Probably everybody in here when they were little saying, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. We used to do that, spit over everybody. Don't let Satan it out. I'm gonna, and we try to louder than everybody else. And, and, and it was good. I never forgot that. That's, that's what we say. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let's let it shine. 
we are a reflection of Christ on the world. And just as salt can lose its saltness, light can become darkness. Jesus said in Matthew 6, if the light becomes darkness, how dark it is. We are like a city set on a hill. We're not a village nestled in, the, in a little valley somewhere that nobody can find concealed from you, but we, from view, but we are a city set on a hill. The church, the true church of Jesus Christ has an, a, a, a wonderful effect on the world if we do what he said. To be effective uh, as a Christian, we must retain his Christ-likeness as salt must retain its saltiness. There are things we need to know about ourselves and about church, the church of Jesus Christ. It is his church. On this rock I will build my church. It's established by the Lord. He started it, and if we allow him to, he'll maintain it. He'll provide for it. He'll give it vision and direction. It's his church. I'm sure you read Psalm 127. 1. Here's what it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. The true church is kept alive by his presence. We sense his presence here today in our worship. It's beautiful to know. You just, you, you just drink it in. And he said this, I will be with you always. He has been and he will be with his church. Whether, he's not, whether, whether he is not present in body, no matter what the building looks like, when he is not present, there's no longer a church. It's, if it's Jesus isn't there. I, I've read of some, some companies that carry the name of someone who was part of that company, chairman of the board, but he retired, but he lends his name to that operation to keep them operating under his name. Jesus hasn't retired. <laughs> he hasn't lent us his name. He is alive and active in his body. It's the presence of Christ that makes church, church. The true church is guided by his word. Acts 4.31 says this, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I love it when you speak the word of God with boldness. I was so proud of Franklin Graham when he prayed at the inauguration, spoke the word of God with boldness. When he, yes, he, amen. Amen. When he went to every capital city of every state in the nation prior to uh, the election, every city he had a prayer meeting. We went to the one in Harrisburg. Thousands of people there in front of the, the, uh, the Capitol building. I, th I think they said there were 7,500 or 8,000 people that, that afternoon praying. He led in prayer, he, he, he gave us a little bit of a ins inspirational talk and then the rest of the hour was in prayer. He prayed and then he asked all the people around him to pray, he did that in every city in the nation, unashamedly standing up for Jesus because he is alive and well. And I praise God for that. I read where a missionary saw an African woman, and she was sitting there with an open Bible and reading. And he said to her, what is this book that you're reading? And she said, sir, I'm not reading this book. This book is reading me. <laughs> Think about that. We need to read the word of God until it speaks to us. Pastor, how many verses should I read every day? It might just take two. Or it might take three chapters, but read it until it speaks to you. The other morning I was, I was laying in bed thinking about getting up. I don't know why four o'clock means so much to God, but I, I'm telling you, it was, 
<laughs> but the, the, the name that came to my mind was Obadiah. Now, I mean, that's not one of your regular books to read unless you're reading through the Bible. There's some of the minor prophets in there that are full of good stuff. And I didn't remember, remember the last time I, I read Obadiah, and I thought, well, maybe he wants me to develop a message out of that book. So I got up and I went and read the whole book. I think it's three or four chapters. But it was a tremendous blessing to me, and it, it enlightened me as to the society in which we live and what's happening around the world. And if the leader of ISIS reads Obadiah, he's going to shiver in his boots for what it says about those who come against Israel. It's an odd, read it when you go home today. It's, not, it's, a, it's a short chapter, but I read it. I just, the word of God speaks to us. And it, 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 it reads us, in fact. I'm not reading this book, it's reading me, is what she said. The word of God was critical to the early church because they were always being assaulted by false teachers and fads and heresy. They all come and go down through the years with time. But if you stick with the word of God, you won't be led astray. I say often, not as often, whenever I need to say it. I said it when I was going into that little series of debates with a liberal professor. Prior to the election, I was, I was asked to debate, and we did one of them here, in fact. But my, my comment is this. What I think doesn't matter. What you think doesn't matter. What God says is what matters. So we got to go by the word of God. And that word of God teaches us and trains us. And we come back over and over again, back to our manual, which is the Bible. It's almost 2,000 years, a little over 2,000 years since this, this uh, truth has been proven over and over and over again. The survival of the church. And you read back over church history and realize what the church has gone through as far as opposition and attacks. It's a mystery to the opponents of the gospel. And one, one, and I quoted this before probably several times, the church is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. And the hammers keep coming but God is, God is good, and he gives us strength. To be guided by the word of God has its roots in the heart of God. So the true church is empowered by his Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, You shall receive power. Power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and then Lansdale, <laughs> the uttermost parts of the earth. Begin in your Jerusalem, which is your home, and your own village, your own, your development, whatever. Begin just letting your light shine, and watch what happens. He said, you will receive power. It's the power source of the church, is the Holy Spirit. And the, we are not made perfect by the flesh, but by the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is absent, it's powerless. The church is not effective. And being one who has sung in hundreds, and I have to say thousands, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating at all when you sing like in 250 churches a year in our travels, and you do that for 20 some years, you sing in thousands of churches, and uh, many, many times we, we went in there and thinking, oh my Lord, this is a refrigerator. <laughs> Not being critical, we, we try to let our light shine and, and, and bring the presence of the Lord through our music. I remember one church in, in Franklin, Vermont, I might have, might have told you about this, I got cold chills when I went in that church and I picked up the, uh, the bulletin was right on the Canadian border, and uh, the lady pastor, and they sat. They they quoted the Lord's uh, the Lord's prayer. They had it printed in the bulletin, and it said, "Our parent, which art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. They would have fit in that march yesterday, the million or so women march, our parent, not even acknowledging the fatherhood of God. It's sad, and it was a church, but, but the true church is empowered by his Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit is present, things happen. People come to Jesus, they're drawn closer to him. It's kind of like, we don't have to shout it down or drum it up or, or um, we used to sing choruses like, I'm going to sing till the power of the Lord comes down. Sing till, and then we say, I'm going to jump till the power. That was youth camp, you know, we did, we used to do that. How many ever did that when you were in youth camp? <laughs> really? <laughs> Judy, you went to the same youth camp, right? But that, you know, that's not the way it happens. You can pray, seek the Lord and worship and praise him. But it's not a spiritual pep rally, but it's a place where the Holy Spirit is clearly defined in him drawing people to God. This power was given to the church. The Holy Spirit was sent. It's a power outside of our natural talents or abilities. There are those that would say the church is not relevant in today's world. That's true where the church has wandered from its purpose. It's not relevant. But the church is trying to answer questions that the world is not asking. We need to just lift up the name of Jesus and he takes care of the rest. The Holy Spirit is the bridge that bridges the gap of centuries and makes this man of Galilee a personal, up-to-date Christ. He will take of mine, Jesus said, speaking of the Holy Spirit, in John 16, he will take of mine and show it unto you. Would to God that we understand that a little more. And one more, the true church is motivated by love and generosity. We will, we will reflect as a church the ultimate act of love that sent Jesus to the cross. The chief of sinners was Paul. And look at, look at how he turned everything around when he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. The main mark of a Christian is love. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Love for the saint. Love for the sinner. Hatred of sin, but love for the sinner. That's true Christianity. In, in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. By this should all men know you're my disciples if you have love. So often we, we, we read, and this blesses me when I hear it, that Christ was moved with compassion. A few weeks ago I preached a message that called Jesus Noticed. He went to Peter's home, 12 guys coming in, 13 of them hungry, tired, demanding food. And the Bible says that Jesus noticed that Peter's wife's mother was sick and he ministered to her. He noticed, even mothers-in-law, he noticed. I think we as, church, we as a church need to be moved with compassion. One of my favorite uh, memories in my mind of, of thinking how Jesus was, there was a series put out several years ago. In fact, we had the, the actor that was playing Jesus here in the church. He got saved because he, was, he had to memorize the entire book of Matthew uh, by heart. And uh, that's how he came to Christ. But he, he, it's called the joyful Jesus. That's what I call it. But it shows how Jesus was moved with compassion. And I just want to take a, a it's about a, maybe a three minute clip from this, from this video just to bless you today. And then we'll wind this down. But you, you watch this and see if this isn't the way you think you would love to think Jesus is and he is. Let it roll, guys. This is the joyful Jesus, the book of Matthew. There's a leper. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, 
if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. said to him uh, see that you don't tell anyone but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. <laughs> amen thank you John Jesus was, <laughs> I love that do you like that that's how I like to think Jesus is <laughs> to love him and to be loved by him, and to love like him. That's why America needs the church today. We're not clones. We're all different. We have all different nationalities. We have Republicans and Democrats and Irish and Dutch and Italians and, and many, many Spanish people, our own Spanish church. But we have one heart and one mind and that is to be like Jesus. The unity of the body of Christ cannot be duplicated outside of the, by the outside world. It can't. They have no idea what it means. The church is not perfect, but we will be. Hallelujah. We will be. We're being made ready to yield to him as a bride is made ready for her bridegroom. So let me give you one more scripture today. Revelation 19 verse 7. Well, we'll finish with Acts, but let me read it to you. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. I'm glad I'm part of the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. And we are, if we're faithful to him, for part of his church. So let's be the church. Let the church be the church. Let's reach our world. Let's speak positively to a lost and dying world. And we have a new incentive, a new lease on that by, with the new administration coming into our country. And uh, I think we need to take advantage of that, capitalize on it for the cause of Christ. Do you agree with me? Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Thank you for your, your attention and your attentiveness and your patience in this kind of long service. But I, did, I don't regret any minute of this service. That was, it was awesome to hear from Chrissy about Morningstar. They have a display out in the foyer. Stop by and look at what's happening there. And uh, appreciate so much. I appreciate you people. I love this church. We just, we're in our 33rd, actually we're now in our 34th year. 33rd anniversary was last week. And uh, let's make it happen for the Lord, individually and collectively. Uh, I'm not saying you need to invite people to church. I think you do, or at least invite them to Jesus and bring them here and they may, might, uh, he might find them here. But let's spread the word. And as we live today, and the things that we can go back to, to take off from, we have more fuel now and, and ammunition than we did before. Hey, what do you think of Franklin Graham praying? Say that to somebody. What do you think of all those people praying in the name of Jesus at the inauguration? I mean, that's a question you could ask to open the conversation. Is Jesus, Jesus is now important to a lot of people 
in America. These are some of the ways that you can get your word in there to share your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you stand before him with nothing to offer, just leaves, you'll just be disappointed when you get to heaven. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing today, for that soul that's here today that's near eternity without Jesus. I pray they'll come and make a confession of faith and leave here a brand new person. Help us all to leave here with the excitement of the gospel. And Lord, I pray that tonight's concert will be another time when your name is lifted up, people are rejoicing in the God of their salvation, and bless and anoint the group as they come. Make us a blessing today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. If you need prayer, come on up front and somebody will pray with you.